Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the two talks that have just gone down have really set the stage for, for what I want to say and, and the, importance, the importance of taxonomy for conservation and also the importance of, um, of looking at conserving evolutionary potential within species, uh, well, within and across species. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the importance of identifying evolutionary significant units in golden moles um, for the purpose of conservation. <coughs> um, so those of you who attended Sarita Maria's talk on Monday will have already heard something about golden moles. Uh, but just, just to introduce you to them briefly, they're a family of small mammals uh, belonging to the Afrotheria. Uh, they're exclusively subterranean. And the only other exclusively subterranean mammal in southern Africa is a mole rat, which is not in any way related to <coughs> golden moles. Um, and yeah, so historically there's been a lot of uncertainty surrounding the taxonomy of golden moles. Uh, this is the current taxonomy, which um, includes 21 described species within nine genera. Um, and these species have been described um, on the basis of morphology as well as geographic distributions. But um, there was no genetic data um, available at the time of this. So we're, there, there is, uh, Sarita um, is in the process of revising the taxonomy of the golden moles. So out of these 21 species, um, many of them are threatened, two are near threatened on the IUCN red list, four are considered <coughs> vulnerable, um, oops. five are endangered and one critically endangered. So as a family they really are quite highly threatened. And to put this in context, of the 13 currently uh, endangered mammals in South Africa, six of those are golden mole species. So why are they so threatened? Um, well, golden moles, because they're exclusively subterranean, they're very dependent on the quality of the soil which they, uh, through which they burrow. Um, <coughs> so they have a, a requirement for soft, sandy or loamy soils. And because they very seldom come to the surface, they also have a very poor dispersal ability. And so this obviously makes them very vulnerable to any disturbances that might fragment their habitat. Um, their, their distributions are easily fragmented and they're also very vulnerable <coughs> to things like mining and urban developments. <coughs> so some species are very well conserved within protected areas across South Africa. But because there is still such a lot of uncertainty surrounding golden mole taxonomy, um, we suspect the presence of cryptic taxa um, within some of these species, and so those can also have consequences for, um, for the threats that, uh, that, those, um, that those cryptic lineages are under. So really, um, really a taxonomic revision is needed, but this requires a lot of data, many levels of evidence, as, as Dion has also pointed out. We need genetic data, and we need to combine that with geographical data, um, morphology, um, and, and everything really that we can put together to describe uh, or to redefine that taxonomy. So that can take time. So ideally, uh, we really need to be able to identify evolutionary significant units. I won't re-describe this to you because uh, that's already been covered, um, so you should have an idea. But, but really, I think the focus should be on, um, on conducting threat assessments, IUCN threat assessments for separate evolutionary significant units when there is a lack of a sound taxonomy um, for these animals. So this, uh, this has already been done in a number of species, and to give just one example from a mammalian species in South Africa, uh, <clears throat> the Cape zebra and the Hartmann zebra were, uh, were described as two separate evolutionary significant <coughs> units in 2005. And they couldn't be described as separate species on the basis that they, they didn't have um, uh, mitochondrial monophyly. But they, they were described as separate evolutionary lineages on the basis that, um, of nuclear divergence between those lineages. And so then, in 2008, the IUCN um, red list, the, um, 
had two separate assessments for those two evolutionarily um, significant units, and I think that that would help substantially to conserve that um, to conserve those lineages. So we don't have that kind of information for golden moles as yet. Uh, one species, the Hottentot golden mole, is listed as least concern on the IUCN red list. And this species distribution, it's considered to be widespread and abundant with its distribution spanning the Maputala and Ponderland Albany hotspot. Um, <coughs> just, just to give you, most of you will be familiar with the hotspot, but just to give you a little bit of background about the hotspot, uh, it's an exceptionally diverse area. Uh, comprising six of South Africa's eight major vegetation types. Um, it also has, I think, nearly 600 tree species, making it one of the, uh, the areas with highest tree diversity of any temperate forest in the world. And is also a refuge, refuge for the critically endangered black rhino. And this hotspot spans KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape, uh, which carry the highest human density in South Africa. And so that puts these ecosystems under, under the strains of um, a lot of the industrial developments that go hand in hand with that human mass. So the Critical e Ecosystem Partnership Fund recently produced this survey uh, where they identified key biodiversity areas within the hotspot based on the distribution of globally threatened species within that hotspot. So this really, this really is an, uh, a focal area for, um, for conservation attention. <clears throat> this hotspot was also, in, in 2011, uh, Pereira and colleagues identified a greater Maputa land, Ponderland, Albany region of vertebrate endemism. Um, and, and the limits of this region actually are highly congruent with, with many vertebrate species distributions, including the Hottentot Golden Mole. Um, and so the aim of my study really was to look at phylogeography in the Hottentot golden mole, the supposedly widespread species, and potentially to identify evolutionary significant units that may be under threat. So we collected samples from across the distribution of Amblosomus, incorporating all five Amblosomus species, and focusing on Amblosomus hottentotus, incorporating the currently described, five currently described subspecies. And there in grey you can see, oh, where's the pointer? You can see the outline of the greater MPA region. <coughs> so this was basically the result. This is a phylogeny of um, combined mitochondria, mitochondrial and nuclear data. And um, the first thing that was, that was really evident is that there's a lot of cryptic diversity within the species, within Amblosomus hottentotus. You can see a lot of um, monophyletic lineages there. The first thing that was interesting is that the subspecies Meisteri, uh, which occurs in the Hraskop region over there, um, appears to be a, a sister species, or a sister lineage in any case, to Amblosomus malii, and is in fact highly divergent from the remainder of Amblosomus hottentotus. <coughs> And also these two species, Septentrionalis and Robustus, cluster within the greater Amblosomus hottentotus clade, which was also very surprising. And then we, we identified a cryptic coastal lineage. Um, these animals from, from around the Durban area were previously considered to be a part of Amblosomus hottentotus pondoliae, uh, which is this group here. But in fact, they appear to be a sister lineage to Amblosomus iris from further north along the coast uh, and highly divergent from Pondolier. And we also identified another cryptic lineage from Umtata, but we only have very few s samples from there, so we would need to do some more sampling to delineate that. So I was also interested in, in taking a closer look at the phylogeographic relationships among these taxa over here. So we've got four lineages of, of uh, Longiceps, which is an Amblosomus hottentotus subspecies, and then these two other species. And what we found is three, um, <coughs> so this is a mitochondrial um, haplocyte network, and we found these three major Longiceps lineages. And you can see here that these lineages 
are separated by a similar number of mutational steps to those separating them from, from robustus and septentrionalis. And then also a closer look at the relationships between this uh, cryptic lineage on the coast and Pondolier. Um, very, very surprisingly, these two lineages are highly divergent from, from each other, despite their geographic proximity. So, <clears throat> sorry. So to, to really summarize what we found, there are quite a number of evolutionary significant units within Amblyosomus hottentotus. What I didn't mention is that we also did um, evolutionary um, dating of those lineages, and those lineages are quite old. Um, some of the youngest lineages are uh, around a million years old, and some of the older lineages up to four million years old. So that's, that's relatively old as, as, as far as diversification within a species is concerned. And then um, <coughs> this Meisteri uh, subspecies, we have uh, support from, from uh, morphological data as well as karyotypic data that that is going to be raised to species level. But species status may also be warranted for some of the other subspecies. And this ties in very nicely with Timu's, what Timu was saying, um, that very often when we look at the DNA, we see, well, there, there really is a lot more uh, deep divergence within the species than one would expect. Uh, we also identified this cryptic coastal lineage, which, if species status is warranted, will become known as Amblyosomus natalensis. And then the cryptic lineage Adam Tata, which may well also uh, represent a unique species. So this work was published in uh, 2015. Uh, okay, but we need further data um, before we can really conduct a robust taxonomic revision. We need additional sampling of some populations. Um, ideally, additional sequences are required. We, We've had very limited nuclear data in our uh, study, and so we would like to incorporate more uh, support from nuclear, um, nuclear gene regions, as well as any other morphological or cytogenetic data uh, that's available for the golden moles. But until then, we really need to recognize these evolutionary significant units because they are not under any kind of protection. And as has already been mentioned, everything is focused on at the species level, and if we don't focus any attention on conserving this evolutionary potential within the species, um, some of those lineages uh, may be lost. Thank you.